Okay, welcome to the homotopy type theory electronic seminar talks. This week's speaker is Raphael Stenzel from Masaryk University. His title is Higher Sites and Their Higher Categorical Logic. Please go ahead. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, and also, yeah, thanks to the organizers for um, having me on. It's, uh, I'm very much humbled. And uh, thanks a lot to the audience for uh, uh, giving me their attention for uh, the next hour. Um, so I have been started thinking about the notion of a general infinity one side some unquantified time ago uh, and what that means for its associated sheaves. And in the meantime, there have been a few papers coming out on this topic as well. Um, and uh, I have been uh, refer uh, referring to um, a few of those in the, in the abstract. One of them is uh, a, paper by, a paper by Anel, Biedermann, Finster and um, Joyal uh, uh, called Higher Sheaves. And another one is also by Anel and Lina Supramanian um, on the plus construction and left exact localizations in infinity categories in general. And so the, the, um, the title, um, in some sense, uh, is just supposed to summarize my efforts in understanding um, the involved notions, taking it from there. Um, I do not want to assume too much familiarity with uh, higher topos theory or topos theory. Um, so first I will indulge in some um, homotopy type theory oriented motivation um, and uh, then set up the um, general um, uh, the, the general uh, theory uh, in, uh, in the second part and the third part where in the first part I will just recall um, what we have in the in the ordinary setting um, and then take it from there to generalize it and draw parallels uh, to in the infinity categorical world. So uh, I will talk about uh, modalities, left exact modalities, and um, I will mention how um, I think you can get log HNE topologies uh, from there. Uh, and then we will index this over a base infinity category and uh, define what a, well, an associated notion of topology is. Um, and then in the end, I will want to look at a few examples. Um, namely, um, we will uh, talk a, few, a little bit about bases um, of such topologies um, using the notion of a modulator, which also was, has been introduced by uh, Anel and Lina Supramanian. We, we will tweak it a little bit, but um, it's essentially that, uh, their, their definition. And then look at a few examples coming from categorical logic, namely the, um, a certain canonical topology for extensive infinity categories. Then we will look how um, these things behave in the regular world and then generalize to a certain um, coherent idea um, that I hope will have some applications maybe sometime in the um, in the future for um, the semantics of um, intentional type theories. Although I am I'm um, yeah I'm on, on the fence about that because I don't understand quite well um, enough what's uh, happening there yet. So the motivation. Uh, first of all, um, we know that an infinity topos is an infinity category, and as such, it does um, exhibit an internal univalent type theory, which is inherently proof relevant. So by that I mean, or want to specifically refer to its intentionality uh, in a non-extensional way, right? So it uh, does negate the uniqueness of identity uh, principle. Um, then according to the propositions as types paradigm, we can think of predicates in, in that type theory as um, well non-monic type families, which are uh, when interpreted at least in the in a model categorical presentation of our infinity topos, as vibrations with vibrant base. Um, and uh, a particular example is, of course, the diagonal, um, whose fibers are the path types, uh, the path objects between two specific specified terms in our uh, base type B. And uh, those path types, these path objects, can be virtually of any homotopy type, right? They are not necessarily minus one truncated. Um, now, this. Uh, this holds in the internal language of an infinity topos. And of course, the terminal such topos, the infinity topos of spaces, also has such an internal language. And when we externalize notions within an infinity topos to uh, the infinity topos of spaces, that still has the same character, right? So even the external logic over infinity topos is still proof relevant in the same way. So to uh, put this in a catchy slogan, um, if we think that the duality of logic and topology is in some sense mathematically universal, and if our logic is proof relevant, then so should be the topology. Um, so what we want to do is, if we start with the small infinity category C, uh, we want to associate to it a canonical C-indexed logical structure, which I will call 
um, yeah, OC, um, such that the infinity topos is embedded in its pre sheaves correspond exactly to the topological ideals or in the opposite, the logical portions of that canonical structure. And in order to capture all such ideals, uh, to draw an analogy to well, commutative algebra, we have to, of course, take quotients at all suitable multiplicative substructures. Now, in ordinary topos theory, such multiplicative substructures are presented by Grotnik topologies, right? Um, and Grotnik topologies are collections of sieves indexed by C. That is, for every object, small c in, in C, we have an um, we have a contravariant functor into the subobject classifier of sets, which just tells us if an error is in there or not. So, in higher topos theory, uh, such a multiplicative substructure should not just be such a decidable um, two-valued um, object, right? Uh, we should think of it as a as a as a contravariant functor into all spaces because all spaces now have the interpretation of predicate and uh, consider basically arbitrary such pre sheaves over the slices, right, where each such value can have any homotopy type. Now, um, to, to draw, the, to draw the, the, the distinction between those two notions further, um, we know that if we give a growing topology, then um, so, such a, uh, that topology is generated by a notion of covers, and covers are just set index collections of objects, right, over a given object C. And um, the sieve that is generated by this, by this, by this cover um, is defined by all the maps that merely factor through one of these components, right? We, we, we are not interested in what this, what this lift is. We just are interested in the, in, the, in the fact that it does factor through one. We forget the lift. And then two such generalized elements of the sieve coincide really if and only if they coincide as generalized elements of the representable C, right? Uh, again, because we have no other data because we forgot the other data. Now, in an infinity categorical context, we can think of proof relevant covers, right? Or higher covers or intentional covers. Uh, there's a host of attributes I could uh, give this to. So instead of just set index collections um, of objects over C, we can think of more general diagrams, right? Raphael is on a, a wired university network. He should be as solid as anyone, but seems to be frozen for me. Let's to the formal column that you coincide. Uh, Raphael? Yes? Uh, we lost you for about 30 seconds there. 30 seconds? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, am I back? You you're, seem to be working fine now. So the yellow word diagrams is, I think, roughly where you were. Uh, the, the second one? Uh, like five lines from the bottom. I see. Okay. So um, you see the full slide though, yes? Yes. All right. So um, what I was saying is, um, so associated with Grotendieck topologies, we have the notion of a cover and a cover is just a collection of objects. Um, the SIF that such a cover generates consists of the maps which merely factor through one of these objects, right, without really being interested in the actual lift, right, we forget the lift, we just are interested in uh, the, the fact that it exists. And then two such uh, generalized elements are equal, if and only if they're equal, as maps into the representable C, um, because that's the, on the only notion of identity we have around because the rest was forgotten. In the infinity categorical world, we can look at generalized diagram, like general diagrams into the slice, and then take the formal co-limit in the pre-shift category, and uh, then consider the general elements of this to be not just maps into C, but maps into C together with a lift into that formal co-limit, right? So we do not forget about those lifts. And then two such generalized elements of our proof-relevant sieve or proof-relevant cover are equal not only if they coincide as maps with domain C, but to get if they coincide together with the lifts that we picked into our formal co-limit. So um, yeah, let's make a let's let's uh, just uh, recall the, the the classical theory a little bit and set it up a bit differently um, so it fits into the infinity categorical context as well. So if we start with a uh, small category. Um, then we can consider the following composition, which uh, takes a, a, an object C and C, associates to its slice, 
and then uh, looks at the maps into the subobject classifier and uh, and sets. And uh, so this takes in fact just by, up to isomorphism, canonical isomorphism. It takes an object C to the uh, frame of sieves over its slice, right? Um, yeah, and we will call this for the sake of the stock the proof relevant logical structure sheet in C. So uh, this is, I mean, this is not a new construction, right? This is a very classical uh, um, uh, functor that has been considered, and it is really the canonical first order hyperdoctrine on C with equality. So in that sense, we will think of OC as a canonical logical equivalent of C. Now uh, we make the following definition: If C is a small category, then we say a sheaf of omega ideals uh, is a regular subfunctor when we consider the thing in, in its opposite. So instead of going to frames, it's a covariant functor onto locals. Um, and we say it's a regular subfunctor with a C index reflector. Uh, e of omega ideals is just a functor of exponential ideals, um, um, such that the, re the reflector, which is a nucleus, um, because it, uh, uh, oh, did I say left exact is a regular subfunctor with C and it should have a left exact reflector. Oh yeah, but it, is, it goes to local, so it, it does. Yeah, anyway. Um, so we want that the inclusion is indexed and the reflector is indexed as well, right? This is all we want. And if we are given such a sheaf of omega ideals, then the associated Grotnik topology consists exactly of the predicates or the elements in the frame omega C, which are nullified in the, uh, the ideal meaning the reflector sends that object to the terminal, to, to the top element, to the terminal object. So we have the following characterization, uh, which is classical, right? If we, if we start with a small category, then the following notions stand one to one correspondence to each other. So we can consider equivalence classes of re reflective left exact localizations of the pre sheaves of C, which are the, infinite, uh, which are the toposes over C. Um, uh, embedded, so yeah, embedded in C, in C hat. Uh, then we have closure operators on the pre shift category, which um, is basically an index left exact factorization system of monomorphisms instead of all arrows in C hat, which again is the same thing basically by construction as a sheaf of omega ideals, which by this notification localization correspondence is uh, the same thing as a Grotnik topology on C. frames, right? Uh, we can talk about elementary vibrations uh, by the growth. Uh, am I still there? Yeah, you, you froze again for a few seconds, but we'll just start the slide over. All right. So um, instead of uh, looking at indexed frames um, over C, we can look at, um, well, basically frames fibered over C, right, by the Grundy construction. Uh, so these correspond to, to certain elementary vibrations. And in this, uh, in this world, a closure operator on C is just an elementary subfibration of, oh, well, the elementary fibration of subobjects, um, together with a Cartesian fiber reflector, which preserves meets fiber wise. All right. Um, and then if we, pu if we pull back um, these two vibrations along the Uneda embedding over C, we really just get exactly the, the omega ideal um, that corresponds to it. And this is the picture that, we'll, uh, that we will look at um, for infinity categories. Um, just a note on, um, on why I call it sheaf. So um, uh, to, every sh to, to every growing topology, um, you can associate a certain sheaf semantics, right? And um, this sheaf semantics uh, has, a, has a local character, the murdoch mclean local character. And this local character is basically just a, um, um, a special case of a more general proposition, which says that if we start with a small category C and we are given such a sheaf E of omega ideals, and then we associate to it the growing leak topology, then the diagram E that we started with is a J stack, meaning for every J cover, um, the functor E satisfies the sheaf sequence that it ought to, right? And if you, if you plug in the terminal objects, then you recover the local uh, character of the, the associated chief semantics. Um, just because this will generalize as well to the infinity categorical world, uh, we just uh, note that um, to be a J sheaf, 
um, can be um, uh, reformulated to say that for every covering SIF, um, the induced map from uh, between the weighted limits um, is an isomorphism, right? So the weighted limit of the representable C um, applied to X is just X at C, and then um, the limit of the sheaf sequence is the weighted limit of um, X with weight S. All right. Now uh, to go to the to the to the infinity categorical world. First of all, um, we recall that uh, an infinity topos, by definition, um, is an accessible left exact localization of an infinity pre sheaf category. So this is um, um, yeah, one of the characterizations that works in the ordinary world, and um, some of those, uh, and we will argue all of those actually work for the infinity categorical world as well. So if we take this as, an, as a definition, um, then we know that uh, by accessibility, um, every such um, left exact localization um, is in fact reflective, and hence may be presented by the e-local objects in the pre-shift category, in pre-shift infinity category. Um, and then there are equivalent definitions that work out as well um, in terms of the Giro axioms or Rask's notion of descent, which are, of course, as it says, uh, essentially equivalent to one another. All right, then um, we uh, can define what a factorization system in any infinity category is. Namely, uh, um, a factorization system is, uh, is just as in the ordinary case, um, two classes of maps which are orthogonal to one another, another which means that for every L map and every R map, if I uh, consider the space of all lifts, then that space is contractible. Um, so we want that L and R are orthogonal to one another. We want that every map has an LR factorization and uh, that the class is L and R closed on retracts, right? And we say that a factorization system is uh, of small generation if there's a small set which generates it um, in the way written down here. Furthermore, um, uh, there have been uh, definitions of uh, modalities and left exact modalities um, by Rieke, Schulman, and Spitters, and then Anel, Biedermann, Finstein, Joyal. Namely, if we start with a category uh, with pullbacks, then we say that a factorization system LR and B is a modality uh, if the left class is pullback stable, and it is a left exact modality if uh, the full infinity subcategory uh, generated by L in the category of errors is close to finite limits, which basically means. It is a modality and fiber wise, when we look at it at uh, fiber over B, it is also close on the finite limits. So um, the, in order to relate this notion of left exact modalities to um, infinity toposes embedded in C hat, um, there's the proposition that if we start with a presentable infinity category with universal co-limits, so for instance, B might be an infinity topos, then to give a, accessible left exact localization of B is the same as to give a left exact modality of small generation on B, which was essentially proven in the paper of Anel Biedermann, Finstein, Joyal. There's just a little thing with accessibility uh, with, 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 the no, with the notion of small generation there, but that, that's minor. So it's, it's basically a result of in, in, in the paper. Small generation in infinity topos. So, um, we can do that by uh, looking at the following fiber structures over B. If we start with an infinity category with pullbacks, then uh, there's the following correspondence. The factorization system on B is the same thing as a fiber refractive localization of the error category, such that the, um, the local arrows, right? Uh, the, 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 um, the category of um, uh, yeah, the category E, uh, it cont contains all identities at, as objects, and all its objects are close in a composition. Now, um, this was also mentioned in the uh, Rieke Schumann Spitters paper, and in the ordinary categorical framework, it was, uh, it's, it's an old result. It actually, I, I, there's an old paper by um, uh, Kelly and uh, Bin Im that I know due to John Burke, uh, which is very nice and also already contains this more generality, which does not require B to uh, be close in a prolex. It's not hybrid then, but um, Essentially, it's that statement. Uh, the other um, qualities of modalities, left exit modalities, etc., um, in terms of this of this uh, fiber reflective localization. So, if uh, we want to look at modalities, 
then these are the fiber reflected localizations such that the fiber reflector on top is Cartesian, meaning it preserves Cartesian errors, right? So we know that the, the right adjoint occlusion is Cartesian, but the left uh, adjoint is not necessarily Cartesian. Uh, then it is a left exact modality if it's uh, fiber reflective and the reflector is in fact not only Cartesian, but also left exact. So it preserves all finite limits. And then lastly, um, we can um, enforce that uh, condition on, of small generation by um, asking that um, that fiber uh, localization is fiberwise ex accessible. Um, all right, so we have understood uh, left exact modalities of small generation in terms of um, certain reflective um, localizations of um, the target vibration, right? Um, so how is that useful? Um, and again, most of this was already contained in the Rika Schumann's Bitter's paper. Um, so uh, let me first say a, a, a remark before I go on uh, from here. So um, such reflected localizations, which are Cartesian by definition, um, are also due to this um, adjunction, also co-Cartesian. Um, we, can, we can equip it with a co-Cartesian structure. And uh, that uh, right adjoint that we, um, uh, which is the inclusion, right? Um, is essentially basically exactly that what turns it into a Cartesian log infinity category in terms of Jacobs, uh, which he um, defined in his paper on comprehension categories. And it's given by the sharp construction in the Anel Biedermann Finster Real paper, in case some, some of you read that. So uh, the second part of the proposition uh, gives us a one to one correspondence between modalities on D and what you what you would call a full Cartesian law V infinity category with strong sums. So I want to just add a little technical lemma here. Namely, if we start with the fiber reflected localization, then uh, this um, condition that our class closed on the composition has a dual has a um, has a dual formulation. Namely, we can ask that the co-Cartesian action is conservative. Uh, and there are a few other conditions that are equivalent to this as well. Um, but this particular is interesting. First of all, it will be interesting later when we uh, index things over our base category C. And second of all, it, uh, uh, it allows for the study of these notions in a non-full setting, right? Because if we want uh, things to be close in the composition, that somehow um, suggests that uh, our um, category E should be full in there. Otherwise, it's not clear what that means. But this conservativity of the, con of the uh, co-Cartesian structure uh, does not require that. All right, so um, one way to go is um, to internalize things. So um, we first note that um, we are given um, a left ex like an, an adjunction over B, right? Uh, where both um, the left and the right adjunct are fibered. And uh, one can show that um, such a fibered adjunction is really a, um, is, is an adjunction in the infinity cosmos of Cartesian vibrations, if and only if those two functors are in fact Cartesian themselves. And why is that interesting? Well, we can, well, it's a sledgehammer to use, but uh, we can use the back monodicity theorem, which was proven in this very general setting by a real and verity to um, associate adjunctions in this um, infinity cosmos, right? The um, infinity category of Cartesian vibrations over B two homotopy coherent monads in, in, um, in the, the same infinity cosmos. So this uh, gives us in the following a one-to-one -one correspondence. Namely, we can start with these things that uh, characterize left exact modalities of small generations, right? Which are, it's a mouthful, fibered accessible re reflective left localizations with this and that um, additional structure and certain idempotent monads, which also have similar structure, right? we uh one translates to the other um and uh, to just to, to to not say the full thing out loud every time we say that um a modal operator on b is such a, a left exact a fiber left exact that important monad on the error, error infinity category um so we how does that help us to internalize things uh well there is a certain functor namely from internal categories in b to the cartesian vibrations over b uh, which is called externalization. Um, and that works every time B is presentable. 
Um, and so what works is that this externalization functor is a cosmological embedding, meaning um, we have all that higher categorical structure living in the, in the left cosmos, and we have higher categorical structure living on the right one, and it, it, uh, it fully faithfully translates uh, the higher categorical structure from the left to the right, and it reflects it as well. Um, so we can use a lot of abstract nonsense without really understanding what we're doing uh, just by translating these abstract structures from the right to the left. So um, first of all, if we start with a, with a presentable B, right, then we can uh, stratify things um, along cardinality. So um, the target vibration is the union of uh, all its small um, target vibrations where we uh, truncate as at a, at a um, cardinality level kappa. And then we can show that, whoops, now you can't read that, one second, that if we um, start with an infinity topos, then we know it has object classifiers, and those object classifiers allow us to, in fact, um, represent the whole slice, the whole small slice, by an associated internal category. Um, so uh, we have the object classifier pi kappa, and we can associate to it a certain internal nerve such that the externalization of the internal nerve is exactly that small slice. So we can start with our idempotent monads on, uh, the, on Cartesian vibrations, stratify them along cardinality, and then internalize them uh, to obtain a notion of Lovietian topology, right? So uh, we get a theorem of the following form um to uh to to cl to classify all accessible left ex exact localizations of b if we start with infinity topos right we can do what we did before um and end up with a certain with sequences of eventually pairwise compatible modal operators on our um well object classifiers which satisfy this composition formula uh, and are accessible in the sense that um as they uh, preserve kappa filtered colimits for a certain common kappa, right? So this uh, this this is parallel to the to the fact that um, well, what is a Lovietian topology? It is a homomorph like internal homomorphism from the subobject classifier to itself, satisfying um, certain um, axioms. Um, now we have this, I mean, in, in some sense, it's perfectly analogous, except that we have this, this composition thing uh, floating around. And what I think this, this, this uh, means, what this translates to, is that, um, I mean, to, to, to say that if we have a composition F and G and we determine um, our endofunctor T at the composition by just determining what it does in F and G as objects, right, is the same as to say, if we consider F as a, as a one cell, right, from its from the composition to G, then T, the endofunctor, is determined on what it does on one cells by what it does on zero cells, uh, and uh, by extension on our higher cells. So, in some sense, uh, this endofunctor is uh, determined by its value on the core, together with um, the the additional information of what the unit does. Uh, which again is parallel to the fact that when you come when you commonly define Lovietian topologies, we don't give them as um, homomorphisms of internal posets. We just give them as a functor from omega to omega with certain uh, uh, properties, and then the fact that it preserves the partial order um, um, pops out. Right? We don't have to um, um, explicitly ask for that. All right, so how do we um, use this now to index things over, over a domain category C? Well, we can do the same thing now um, as we did in the ordinary case, um, but instead of just looking at um, um, two-valued uh, two -valued propositions, uh, we did what we, what we wanted to do before, namely looking at all um, space value appreciates. So what we can do is uh, consider the following composition here. So that um, the value um, of this composition at an object C is, uh, well, all precious on the slice or equivalently all right vibrations of the slice. So we will think of um, um, an object in here, right, which is a right vibration of the slice as consisting of the witnesses that this predicate holds. Uh, and so sections, um, sections of such a right vibrations, uh, of such a right vibration gives us a coherent choice of witnesses, but it 
existence of such a section does not uh, contract the predicate, right? There might be many different sections which are not, not homotopic to one another. Um, so uh, we have that uh, we have that composition here, and uh, it is not only just a um, indexed infinity category, but it in fact is an indexed infinity topos. And the maps between those are not just geometric morphisms, but in fact, ital geometric morphisms. So it's in a joint triple with certain um, um, additional properties, which I will refer to in a second. So we will um, uh, we will denote the induced composition by OC and call this the proof relevant or the higher or the I don't know intentional logical structure sheet associated to infinity category um, with image in um, infinity toposes and ital maps. Now, what is this? Uh, what is this domain? Let me just uh, quickly um, um, define that. So, um, instead of frames, as in the in the um, one categorical world, we now look at um, infinity the infinity category with infinity topologies and geometric morphisms, and it's opposite. So, R top is uh, with geometric morphisms. L top is the opposite. So, the arrows in L top are uh, basically just the left exact co-continuous functors between infinity topologies. A geometric embedding is a geometric morphism with it, which is fully faithful in the R top direction. And when he comes back, oh, there we go. Raphael, we lost you again. Um, when Are you in the middle of the slide with the geometric morphism? Yes. Uh, it shows me I'm unsta uh, I'm stable now. Now it looks good. Yeah. Right. It it almost it's always always shows me I'm unstable. Apparently with with a couple second lag. I'm sorry for that. So a geometric embedding is a geometric morphism which is fully faithful in uh, the right adjoint direction. So in the in the R top direction. Um, and then we say that a geometric morphism is ital if it is up to equivalence, the forgetful functor from some, from, from some slice into our infinity topos E. And then we denote uh, accordingly uh, then the infinity category of, of toposes with, with ital geometric morphisms uh, by R top et, and it's opposite again by L top et. Geometric morphism. sure what we can do about this. Oh, totally gone. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, the last two lines uh, just give us a little bit uh, further notation. Um, uh, defining the category of uh, topos with, with the tal geometric morphisms in between them, and uh, it's opposite. Right. Now, in order to uh, um, to, to recognize um, an ital uh, geometric morphism when we see one, we have the following uh, criterion: namely, a geometric morphism is ital if and only if it satisfies the following three conditions. Namely, the geometric morphism has a further left adjoint, which is conservative, and satisfies um, a certain generalized Beck Chevalier condition, uh, often called the projection formula. Now, the interesting part here is the conserv conservativity of the left adjoint, because this is exactly um, what uh, corresponded uh, to the composability of uh, the right classes, uh, of the right maps before, right? So um, we make the following definition. Um, given a small infinity category C, uh, we say that a sheaf of OC ideals E um, is a fiberized accessible for subfibration of our canonical uh, structure sheaf uh, with a fibered Cartesian left exact left adjoint um, such that if we only consider E on its own as an indexed uh, infinity category, it gives us a tal maps between the um, corresponding toposes, right? 
which is uh, an analogy to the definition of closure operators and um, omega ideals that we have in the ordinary case. Um, so we can think of, uh, given such a sheet of OC ideals and given a MED, right, then we have this restriction um, functors between the slices and the restriction functors um, on, the, on the local objects together with an embedding and a, and a, localization, and a localization functor such that everything commutes up to um, a multiple. So uh, then we have a the theorem that a left exact modality of small generation on our pre sheaf category is the same thing as a sheaf of OC ideals. And the proof is essentially just a left Kahn extension and a restriction argument along the UNADA embedding, right? So uh, we have seen that a left exact modality over the pre-shift category um, corresponds to a certain sub vibration with a left adjoint, et cetera. And we can restrict the whole thing um, along the UNADA embedding and pull back and uh, obtain a sub vibration on this side. Uh, and then one sees that um, all the, all the uh, properties correspond to one another, right? In the other direction, if we start with, a, uh, with such a sub vibration, we can left can extend it along the UNADA embedding and using descent, uh, we get exactly that uh, this will be such a sub vibration of, um, uh, of the target vibration. So uh, this yields a, a natural notion of a higher topology or um, proof relevant topology as follows. If we start with a um, sheaf E of OC ideals, uh, then we can pointwise nullify um, the predicates, <laughs> um, namely by considering um, yeah, we, we define the, the topology at C as just a pre-image of all contractible objects, right? So we consider all the arrows over a presentable, uh, which are sent to the terminal object, just as before um, a growing topology was exactly the, um, the class of monos, which are sent to the top element. Um, and um, then uh, we obtain um, we obtain a notion of, of higher proof of and growing topology if we ax axiomatize this um, uh, this sort of class abstractly. We can do that in the following way. So if we start with a small infinity category, then we say a proof level topology on, on, on C is uh, just a collection of arrows, right, over its representables, uh, which satisfies the following uh, properties. Um, the first three being familiar from the ordinary case, namely um, it's unital, it's stable. Um, so the pullback of uh, element in J is again uh, but then further, and that it's transitive in the following way that if we have a map that is locally contained in J and we compose it with a map that is in fact in J, then um, their composition is in J again. But then we need further, um, further axioms, namely we need um, um, a closure on the finite limits fiberwise, and uh, we need a closure on the uh, pushouts also fiberwise. Um, and then we may have to make sure that the whole thing is actually generated by a set. And we can do the same trick as it is uh, done with the factorization systems. So if we start with the set G and look at all um, the proof relevant topologies uh, that, are, that, it con um, uh, that contain G, then their intersection is again such a topology. And then we say that such a proof relevant topology is of small generation if there is a small set um, such that it is the smallest one containing G. Right. And then we will refer to a tuple CJ as an infinity one side. And we do obtain, uh, again, a one-to-one -one correspondence uh, between sheaves uh, E of OC ideals and, by nullification, um, proof relevant topologies J of small generation on C. Um, so this uh, gives us uh, right, the, a mirroring of the picture that we have in the ordinary case. So, uh, so just a few words on uh, ordinary growth topologies. So um, we can, given a, such a proof relevant topology, we can uh, consider its intersection, intersection with the monomorphisms and that does give us always a growth topology. And we obtain uh, this specific growth topology does give us a factorization of uh, the localizations um, um, of, of the associated localizations into a topolo topological followed by a co-topological localization. Um, furthermore, a Grotnik topology itself is not, is not quite a proof relevant topology because monomorphisms are not close to the pushouts. Um, but every Grotnik topology does generate proof relevant topology, which generates the same localizations. Yet, I mean, the definition is stable in some sense as every, um, 
proof relevant topology within the say proof relevant proof irrelevant context is exactly growing topology right so if you do not look at the um at the uh, target vibration but the vibration of uh, sub objects and we um, impose uh, the conditions one to six on a sub vibration of that then we obtain exactly the definition of a growing topology uh, and lastly uh, in this in this uh, conceptual part uh, to, to justify the sheaf denotation of, uh, of, of our um, ideals. Uh, we again have the, um, the statement that um, if we are given a, uh, such an infinity one side and we have an associated sheaf of OC ideals E, then E is indeed J stack in the following sense, namely if we start, if, if, we, if we take any J cover, um, then the canonical map of weighted limits is, a, is an equivalence. Right, which is uh, again basically um, um, a, trans, uh, a translation of what we had in the ordinary case as well. So in that sense, it is really a sheaf of OC ideals. All right. Um, so I would. Uh, this is the first part. Um, the second part will be um, about examples um, coming from. Um, well, classical examples in categorical logics. Are there any first any questions to the first part so far? All right. Um, so uh, in order to now in order to to to, to study examples, um, right? We we saw that I mean all the structures that we gave are quite involved. It, it might it, not, it may be hard to actually like construct examples of such which are non-trivial or not growth topologies already, right? So. Um, Anel and Alina Subramanian uh, introduce the notion of modulator, uh, which will serve the, the, the purpose of a basis um, for, for, uh, for these topologies. So if we start with a small infinity category C, then they say a, a pre-modulator M is just some small collection of arrows which contain, which contain the identity. And uh, we say it is modulator if it is pullback stable, right? So um, if the um, if we can actually fiber that thing over C. Um, and then thirdly, uh, a modulator is a Lex modulator. Fibers um, are co-filtered. Now co-filtered is basically just a condition which is enough, right? It is sufficient for what they want to, what they want to do. Um, but you can think also in the examples that we will have uh, that it is uh, fiber-wise um, close on the finite limits. Um, we make a one. Uh, we make a. We tweak the definition a little bit because um, I found it hard to find examples of Lex modulators even, and they gave a definition of something weaker called the delta modulator, which I also found found hard to find examples for. Um, and so I found something in the middle uh, which works well. So uh, we will say that a modulator is an identity modulator if uh, if we start with an element in M and we consider two sections, then we can take the equalizer uh, over the, over the codomain. And what we ask for is that the equalizers again contain an M, right? Um, so in some sense, M is closed under equalizers of sections. Um, the, the, why this is useful is first of all, if we, um, if we uh, have a modulator which is fiber-wise closed under finite limits, so it's a particular Lex modulator, then it is an id modulator. And in fact, if it's in some sense transitive, then these uh, two notions are equivalent to one another. And secondly, if we start with an it modulator, then it is a so-called delta modulator, right? which is also a notion they defined. And the problem with delta modulators was that um, they, in their definition, they make a reference to the modality it generates. And if I don't know what the modality looks like, uh, I have a trouble to, to verify that notion, that, that condition. So an it modulator basically is a closed definition in that it only talks about elements uh, in M and categorical structures, uh, categorical constructions, which are, um, um, uh, which M is ought to have a closure properties for. So um, in, their, in their paper, they show that uh, every Lex modulator and every Delta modulator um, generates a left exact modality by a transfinite duration of the plus construction. And so in particular, we get that every it modulator generates a left exact modality. So um, obviously, um, 
Uh, not obviously. So we can we said that uh, every pr a proof relevant of topology of small generation is generated by a small set, but we can always uh, extend that small set to be actually um, fiberwise closed on a finite limits and pullback stable and things like that. So in fact, every proof relevant topology of small generation is generated by a, um, uh, a very well behaved flex modulator. And secondly, every growing topology is trivial in modulator, right? It's even like a lex modulator with finite limits, um, but in a very trivial way, right? So if we, if we are given an, an element, the growing topology, which is a monomorphism, then of course it has only, it has at most one section of the homotopy. And so all these equalizers are already in equivalence, right? They are, they are contractible. So this is in some sense a massive overkill. Uh, all we would need is that these are contained in our modulator, but they're covering uh, but they're they're covering in the in the well in the strongest way they possibly could right so we aim to 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 uh to look at example like like to look at an example where this is not the case so uh let yeah let's look at examples so for example uh for instance we can think of um we can we can um recycle the extensive topology right we can define what an infinity category uh, what an extensive infinity category is just in the way we do it with a normal category and then we can look at the following modulator, namely um, uh, we take a final collection of objects and take a co-product and then we compare the formal co-product with the co-product in, in C, right? And uh, I mean, basically by construction, right? What is appreciated that is a local with respect to these guys, it's exactly when it preserves final, final products. And so whenever C is extensive, um, the localization at this uh, modulator consists exactly um, of the of the final, pres final product preserving um, pre sheaves uh, no of the sorry um, no that's right yeah of the final preserve final product preserving pre sheaves and so uh, these are exactly the sheaves which are also extensive for the growth for the extensive growth topology so in particular if C is small extensive then the localization of this modulator is topological and left exact right because it's it coincides with the localization at the extensive growth topology. Um, and it's a very well behaved uh, case. So, we, for instance, we can show that uh, the extent the extensive sheaf category is always hyper complete. Um, the proof basically just works by showing that this inclusion preserves if the co-limits um, because the plus construction basically is uh, um, is computed by certain co-limits of co-products of, of yeah of, of maps out of co-products. Uh, and so we can show that this inclusion preserves the co-limits, and so in particular preserves effective epimorphisms. And because of it, it's left exact, it preserves infinity connected maps, and so they um, all vanish uh, in this sheaf category. And furthermore, if C is small, extensive, and left exact, then you can show that uh, it has enough points, um, and the points of uh, the sheaf infinity topos are exactly the left exact and finite co-product preserving functors from C to S, right? And this is just an application of the um, completeness theorem. Uh, so in some sense, the first example we looked at is, uh, is, trip, is it collapses to the, to the ordinary case, right? Uh, it's, in, it's, in, it's, in, it's inherently proof irrelevant. Um, uh, we, we ought to make, we ought to, to do something higher from homotopical and it ended up not being that. And it does make sense, right? Because I mean, co-products do not add any homotopical information. So one might think that uh, this is always the case. Um, one might think that um, it's always that well behaved, uh, and it's not. Um, a strange case, which I don't really know what to make of, is for instance if we try to look at the regular um, the regular topology, right? So we can define an infinity category C to be regular um, if it is finitely complete, and well, um, it has a notion of effective epimorphisms which are pullback stable. Then we would, uh, we would we could think of trying to just well these maps right by the effect of epimorphism without uh, truncating those maps in the pre shift category. Um, and uh, then it turns out that this thing is not an id modulator at all, right? I mean, first of all, its sheaves are just um, the guys which um, um, uh, send epimorphisms like. Uh, these representable epimorphisms to equivalences. Um, and the problem is the epimorphisms are not uh, close in the finite limits uh, in the error category of C. So uh, this modulator will not be an it modulator. 
In fact, if we just assume a few more things on C, uh, then the left exact localization of this mod uh, modulator um, totally trivializes, right? Uh, the sheaves will, will be just the constant sheaves. So one could ask that, well, if it's too big, uh, what is the largest modulator contained in that, right? So we would uh, ask for a class of morphisms, of epimorphisms in C, such that if we consider their diagonals, they are again epimorphisms. Uh, and this naturally leads to um, the infinity connected maps in C, right? So a map in a regular infinity category C is infinity connected if all its high diagonals are effective epimorphisms. This is a natural definition in this, in this context. Uh, and then it's easy to show that if C is small regular, then the image uh, of the infinity connected maps is a next modulator because this class is close on the finite limits and uh, um, uh, is close on composition. Um, but then can, one can show here that if we just look at this topos, uh, although it is a topos, it is generally not topological uh, and not subcanonical either. So it's not very, like it, it behaves di very differently than a regular topology, for example, right? And one can show that by, uh, well, checking that the um, representable um, pre-sheaves um, in the topological part of it um, are all sheaves, but um, the representables in, in which are sheaves for the full localizations only the hypercomplete objects. So if we find a small regular infinity category, which is not hypercomplete, so where there are non-trivial infinity connected maps, uh, then there is a difference between those localizations and such guys exist, right? I mean, uh, you know, we can just take a small version of the, uh, the uh, Isaacson, uh, Dagger, Hollander, Isaacson topos. Um, and they are not even really comparable. So um, the, the regular sheaves and these, these um, infinity connected sheaves are, are uh, not contained in one another, although the points are, right? So every point for the regular, every point for the regular um, topology is a, is a point for, the, um, for this topology here, because uh, if something's left exact, it preserves epis, it preserves infinity connected maps. So this is a very weird case, like it's not very well behaved at all. Um, but it, it, it feeds in to a more general notion of, um, or more flexible notion of uh, topology, right? Which is for coherent, coherent categories, the coherent topology. And this has an interesting uh, generalization in this case. So this is the last example I want to look at. So if we start with the coherent category C, right? Which is a regular category uh, with monomorphisms, uh, which will, whose, um, yeah, monomorphisms over a base behave, behave well. Uh, then we can define uh, the coherent topology, which is defined as uh, all those collections of objects such that the co-product is epimorphic over the base, right? And then a coherent sieve, uh, a coherent covering sieve consists of those maps which factor through one of those components, right? Now, uh, we could ask that, um, if we start not only with a set, with an indexing set, but with an indexing simplicial set, I, um, which admits not only, again, set index colimits, uh, but I shape colimits, then we can ask uh, questions about the comparison functor between the formal colimit and the colimit in F, right? Uh, now, these, if, if, you, if you look at these classes um, of, of, of arrows, right, over the representables, then it's easy to show that they're modulators whenever C has universal coordinates. But it's not clear if uh, we obtain a lex modulator and id modulator. Uh, the problem is that to obtain an id modulator, um, we have to look at the diagonals and we can pull back those diagonals over these, these specific pullbacks here. And what we want is, oh, let, me get, uh, let me try. So, go away. So we have the colimit. Uh, we have the call limit and we have the components here. And the, comp the, the components here have a non-trivial diagrammatic um, structure in between them, right? Now, if you pick a component Fi and a component Fj, we have the natural projections into those two, which up to a multiple commute in the, col in the call limit. And we want for this to be an it modulator that this pullback here is again, the, uh, that this pullback again can be uh, expressed as a call limit of other small pieces such that each piece is so small, such that the homotopy, uh, which we have here by precomposition, 
is not just a homotopy in the co-limit, but actually factors through one of the components of the original functor f. So we want that the whole homot higher homotopical data um, uh, factors through the components, not only uh, the existence of the lifts, which is in some sense set theoretical. So uh, there is a straightforward way to do this. Um, namely, if we start with the kappa coherent infinity category, uh, then we have a certain, a certain minimal solution, right? So what we do is um, we, uh, take, we take a certain cardinality and uh, then we can um, look at the, this simplicial set here, which just sends um, an n to uh, x to the power of n plus one. And then we can take the Groton deconstruction of that guy and look at functors into C, which is defined at a tuple n and uh, at a tuple n together with a tuple of length n plus one as this uh, at this pullback here, right? Um, then the co-limit of um, of this diagram here gives us exactly something like here in the diagram, and uh, this can, the, this pullback here can be decomposed in small pieces, well, the, in, into exactly one small piece, namely the whole global um, pullback here uh, fits into this um, fits into this diagram because the whole span here is containing the image of our functor, right? So. Uh, um, yeah, if we if we if you look at um, these maps, these these, these formal comp comparison maps of co-limits for tuples where x is a set and f is such a functor, um, then the it modulator which we obtain from that is exactly the one that generates the kappa coherent Gordon topology on C. So we we would like to generalize that. So um we have to do is um we want to look at all the all the pieces that come from the functor f itself um with structure from the domain category i and we want that the whole thing here covers also the pullback right and we want this condition then also to be stable on our diagonals so we have to iterate these things so the thing that we end up is a bit of an involved definition um Namely, we can look at the following post set. Uh, we let S infinity be the post set which consists of um, these zigzags uh, for n in the natural numbers, right? So it's, this is a graph, and we take the uh, post set generated by it. And then we can truncate at n to give, get a definition of Sn, and we can just add a point in the end to obtain a definition of dn plus from, from, uh, for the disk of dimension n plus 1. And then we can make a definition given a map uh, from Sn to a certain infinity category i. Then we can look at all the extensions to the disk um, by taking the pullback here. We make the following rather complicated looking definition. Um, if we start with a category with pullbacks and kappa small co limits, and we have uh, um, an indexing infinity category with pullbacks, then we say that F is covering if it has this iterative. Uh, this iterated covering a condition, right? So um, we can, in some sense, uh, compute the the nth path type or the nth path object here um, by taking um, the necessary coordinates. And then we obtain that if uh, we, we we fix a cardinal kappa, then we can look at the modulator generated by these um, comparison maps for covering functors and uh, categories i with pullbacks and this is an modulator indeed and it is quite fun to play around with this with this uh, with this notion and check out a few examples but it is quite complicated still uh, and i uh, don't really have a good feeling for it so uh, i have to so a few remarks on that so first of all um uh it's not it, it's not trivial right um it is subcanonical so all the representables are pre-shifts for it Whenever C is descent or something a little bit like descent for a certain choice of diagrams, then uh, the slice functor, uh, the, the, the slice functor is a sheet for it. Then whenever C is on top, uh, this joint code product, so it's extensive, the extensive covers are also M kappa covers. And so every sheaf for this modulator M kappa is also an extensive sheaf. And more generally, in fact, every kappa coherent cover is also a cover for M kappa. 
where we just have to, if we start with a finite, if you look at finite coherent topology, because delta, um, delta up there is infinite, we have to actually take your m kappa plus, but otherwise the kappa is the same. And so we can sh show that actually every m kappa sheaf is also a kappa coherent sheaf. And I have to say here that I so far proof that these are actually different from another evaded me. Um, so it could be in the end that they collapse to the same thing. I, I doubt that, but I, I, I don't know uh, so far. Um, ah, thanks. So um, the points obviously, again, of this sheaf of this uh, uh, infinity topos are exactly the left exact functors, which preserve this notion of column. I think the columns are covering functors. And I'm wondering if this, I mean, I, I would like to think a bit of, um, of uh, this notion of classifying infinity topos for intentional type theories and uh, right whose points then should um, correspond to models of uh, these type theories and spaces. And uh, I was, I, I'm wondering if this notion of um, co-limit is a good notion of co-limit to um, uh, be, um, be a model for intentional type theories with certain inductive, type, uh, inductive types or high inductive types. Um, I don't understand that notion well enough yet, but the hope is that it does. And if it does not, uh, that still something similar uh, applies to um, give a good notion of uh, model and hence a good notion of uh, classifying things in top us. Uh, yeah, and that, that, that was it. Uh, thanks a lot. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so now we will do our traditional silent applause. And we'll open the floor to questions. So if you have a question, please just unmute your mic and go ahead. I was wondering if these slides are available. I mean, I know they will be soon, but what if we're impatient? <laughs> I can send to them to you right now. Uh, I mean, this is the first time I talked about this, which is the reason why it was all over the place. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I can send them to you right now first. Thanks. I'll ask a question. So you, you've cited the Riker Schulman Spitters paper there, which is done in homotopy type theory, and you mentioned it several times. So how much of what you've done could be done in homotopy type theory rather than in infinity toposes? Yeah, so I mean, uh, much of it has been done in that paper, right? Uh, and in some sense, it has, it has in, like at least for my intuition, I think for many other people's intuition, it has been the blueprint for what ought to hold semantically or what ought to uh, hold in the infinity topos world, in fact, uh, as well. Um, so um, I think when it comes to this general theory, um, they did what can be done. Uh, when it comes to the study of specific, um, uh, well, such topologies and their sheaves and uh, how they behave, right? So the second part, basically, the study of examples. Uh, I don't know. I didn't. Uh, I didn't think about that um, at all yet. Uh, maybe if I have a better intuition about it uh, in, in the infinity categorical world, I might think of, of uh, internalizing that in this syntactic fashion as well. Um, but so yeah. far, I haven't. But that's that's more of what I was talking about, like the the notion of this. General, the generalized notion of the grown deep topology that you have would be one thing in particular that I, I wonder if there's a way to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, in the so I only have a uh, I only have a vague memory of the details of the paper, but they they in the in the uh, Rika Schumann Spitters papers they did talk about nullifi nullification, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, its uh, its relationship to localization and um, uh, left exit modalities. Um, so there is something of that in there. Um, but I, I don't know how far that can be taken. I didn't, I didn't, um, yeah, I didn't think about that. Okay. More questions? So we've got lots of time. I mean, yeah, no pressure, right? I mean, I was, uh, oh, I meant to convey so much more intuition and conveyed so little intuition. <laughs> I cannot blame anyone for not having too many questions. 
Okay, well, maybe we'll wrap up the formal part and people might stick around and ask some informal questions. So let's, let's talk, thank Raphael again. And our next talk is in two weeks. Uh, it is Tai Chi Umira. So I hope to see you all then.